Okay. Got it. And so, <coughs> so photosynthesis. Um, and so when photosynthesis first came about, it's thought that they, uh, it has evolved in um, a type of bacteria called cyanobacteria. This bacteria is still around today. This bacteria is a type of bacteria that can actually produce oxygen through photosynthesis, and so it's a photosynthetic bacteria. So not only just plants do can do photosynthesis. And so because of the fossil, uh, because of the, that, um, we have prokaryotic cells, then an increase in atmospheric oxygen, and so that bacteria is thought to have produced the oxygen that was in the atmosphere. And so then, <coughs> so the oxygen began accumulating in the atmosphere, and um, it had some effects on living things because oxygen, now you're changing the environment in which organisms lived. So it posed a challenge for some living things. So some living things um, may, have, may have had issues living in the presence of oxygen. Um, provided an opportunity to gain energy from light, that's through photosynthesis, um, and, and um, uh, absorb light energy to do photosynthesis and make glucose. And then allowed organisms to exploit new ecosystems, um, and um, uh, some organisms, the oxygen accumulation may have caused it to them to die off, leaving more resources for other organisms to take over. So that's your the prokaryotic cells and atmospheric oxygen. So then, now we have eukaryotic cells. This part is a review. We've talked about it many times about um, how eukaryotic cells came about. So um, they evolved from much simpler prokaryotic cells. So um, oldest eukaryotic cells date back to 2.1 billion years ago. So again, order prokaryotic cells, atmospheric oxygen, now our unicellular eukaryotic cells. How do they come about? Remember endosymbiosis, so this is a review. Um, remember the mitochondria, plastids are a group of organelles of which chloroplasts are an example of. Remember they were engulfed um, by prokaryotic cells and um, so, so the prokaryotic ancestors of mitochondria and plastids probably gained entry to the cell as kind of undigested prey. They were taken in by endocytosis um, and so on. And then they became more in interdependent and um, the host in the endosymbionts, that would be the mitochondria and the chloroplasts here, so this is the mito and chloroplasts, would have become a single organism. And so, so therefore, prokaryotic to eukaryotic cells. So that's what we talked about before. That's a picture there that we've looked at before. And remember that there's evidence to support this. Uh, the intermembrane structure and function of the mitochondria and the chloroplasts um, uh, are similar to prokaryotic cells. So they. And then also they have their own circular DNA, and I'm going to add here, and they have ribosomes. Circular DNA and ribosomes. Just like prokaryotic cells. So now we have eukaryotic cells, and so now we have to look at eukaryotic cells um, coming together to form a multicellular eukaryotic organism. So these endosymbiotic events taking in the chloroplast and the mitochondria, horizontal gene transfer, the swapping of genes, contributed to the diversity of different types of eukaryotic cells. So we had um, many different types of unicellular eukaryotic cells. Uh, oh, you don't have this, do you? I forgot it. I skipped that one. I, um, so I was leading into multicellular. I forgot to delete this. Um, so the multicellular, now when eukaryotic cells come together to form a multicellular organism, we're going to talk about the hypothesis about that. So, so you have a, the unicellular eukaryotes and then multicellular forms come after that. So the oldest fossil of a multicellular eukaryote dates back to 1.5 billion years ago. Uh, and that, that fossil is of a small algae. And it makes sense because um, most fossils, um, it's thought that life began in the water, and that according to the fossil record, and then became terrestrial or on land. And so, so 
So we have small algae, the first um, uh, multicellular eukaryotic organisms. Larger organisms um, don't appear until much later, several hundred million years later. And um, we also have found fossils even of animal embryos. Uh, and so there, I have a picture here. Um, this is um, a fossil that's thought to be two different animal embryos in the embryonic stage, which are very, very small. That's why they're using, it says SEM, the scanning electron microscope, to see. And so this is a, remember, everybody starts out being a zygote, and then we divide and become two cells big. So that's that first division here. So we have two cells, and then this is later on multiple cells. And these are thought to be um, early embryos um, of animals. And so showing um, multicellularity. And <coughs> um, they believe that, that first, the first multicellular eukaryotic organisms were actually colonies of different cells that come together and kind of live together and work together in a colony, but yet are still separate microorganisms. And so this is a colony of photosynthetic cells. Did I go too fast? No. And then some cells in the colonies become specialized for different functions. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. So, you want to talk about it? Oh, yeah. Okay, so. Well, um, Liam has something to share. There, there is a, a jellyfish or what it was believed to be a jellyfish called the Portuguese man of war for a while. And this thing is like poisonous and 50 feet long and like really terrible. You don't want to like touch it in the ocean because it's gonna hurt. But anyway, so upon further inspection in the 40s, scientists realized that it's actually not a jellyfish, it's called a, I think it's called cephalophore. Um, and that it's actually thousands and millions of tiny little organisms that are all a colony, and they all have a specialized purpose. Like part of part of these organisms are like the the stinging end of the organism. Others are like the propelling end of the organism. Others are like the brain of the organism, and that they're they're all separate in organisms, but they all depend on one another for survival. Which is like, how did that evolve? No one really like people people knows that it's it's from this that they have formed colonies and are specialized for different functions just like that. Right. So, so that's something that is around today, kind of giving the idea with the same thing that I'm just talking about here with the hypothesis about the origin of eukaryotic organisms, all right? And so that's something that's around today that um, uh, let's kind of look into that, okay? So then the first cellular specializations had already appeared in the prokaryotic world. There were already organisms um, becoming specialized in bacteria and why not in um, eukaryotic organisms. All right, and then on our timeline that we looked at, we have um, the, what, in the fossil record what they call the Cambrian explosion. So remember I said that that's not a physical explosion, but it's an increase in sudden diversity of organisms on Earth based upon the fossil record. So most of the major phyla of animals appear in the fossil record. Um, the first million, or 20 million years of this Cambrian uh, period. And so we have an increase in diversity um, around this time. That's where the explosion comes. And then we see that, remember before this, a lot of the plants and animals were in the water, so now we see then the colonization of land. And so we have land plants, land animals, um, and so on. And then to round it all up, to kind of relate it back to um, what we talked about with chapter 25, um, and so on, and making this phylogenetic tree of life, um, that, uh, that when we make a tree of life that we use all of our different data and all of our different resources. And so molecular data like DNA and proteins um, have given us new insights into the tree of life and we've um, changed it um, based upon what we've learned. So when we look at um, the next bullet, it says early classification systems had two, king had two kingdoms. You guys remember what the two were? Plants and animals, all right? So plants and animals. 
Then we learned that not everything, we found some organisms that don't necessarily fit into plant or animal kingdom, but there are some differences um, between the organisms that we put originally into the plant kingdom and originally into the animal kingdom. So we changed that to five kingdoms there, and they give you the five kingdoms, Monero, Protista, Plantae, Fungi, and Animalia. So I said, said that that's what they, I had learned in high school myself. Is in the five kingdoms. And but now what now if we look underneath this picture here, now it's been replaced by three what? What do you put them? Domains. Alright, the three domains. Archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. And which one are we more closely related to? Archaea. Archaea, that's right. We're part of eukarya, right? The domain eukarya. And then each domain is split into kingdoms. Kingdoms. your two packets, um, the phylogenetic tree and the um, mass extinction packet. I'm going to pass those back real quickly here and we're going to go over the answers to that. Um, and then um, yesterday I had uh, requests for, to make review videos for the different chapters. So during my conference hour I made one for chapter 22 and 23. And so then after school before I leave I plan on doing 24 and 25. I probably won't wait, make one for 26. We just just did 26 as most recent in our heads, um, but I'll do one for 24 and 25. All right. So that's that too. What's going to be on the short answer? Something to do with evolution. No, but. Um, you guys, uh, it's the same format as all the other tests, so multiple choice, short answer. You, there is um, some math, so there's like, I have a Hardy Weinberg problem, all right? P and Q, okay? Um, if there's time after we go over the answers, um, uh, if there's time, I'll, I can do a couple of practice problems with you. Um, if we don't have enough time, I can do it on the review video. Um, I also have a sheet I told last hour. I have some practice problems with an answer sheet that I'm going to upload to my website. So if you want to do a few practice problems more with the answer key to see if that's something that you feel like you need practice with, you can. Okay? Um, but for sure, you're going to have to calculate P and Q and, and that kind of thing. So you need a calculator um, that would be helpful to have a calculator All right, um, for that. Okay? All right, so let's pass that. Yeah. 
Then we can figure out P. P and Q have to equal one, so P has to be then 0.7. And then the question is though, what proportion of the field is heterozygous? So then we can use 2 PQ for that. And so 2 times 0.3 times 0.7. So that gives you 0.42. Um, so that's the that's the frequency um, in that would be the same as 0.2%. Okay? How do let me just point out, like, let's say, let's say instead of um, here I wrote, instead of saying 90 white, what if I were to write, so if I were to, instead of that, I wrote 910 red. Can we take 910 and divide it by 1,000 and get any frequency? Red individuals, what two genotypes could they be? Big R, big R, or big R, little r. And so therefore, we can't, we, this isn't, we can't get a frequency and say, oh, this is for sure the frequency of the big R gene because some of these 910 have a little r in the mix. And so that's why I said that you always have to focus on the recessive. So if I were to give you this, if I were to give you this straight off, off the bat, You'd have to say, okay, I can't do anything with 910 red out of this 1,000. But then what do I know, though? If 910 are red, then 90 of them have to be white. And then I'd use that same, then I'd start with the same fraction, okay? But you have to, so always look at what you're given and try to work to the recessive, all right? Work back to the recessive. And then once you do that, you can figure out everything, okay? So, um, uh, uh, so I, I will um, upload, I have some other problems, so I have um, some other problems. I'll upload this sheet here if you want to do some more practice problems of the same type of thing. And I'll include it at the second page, my answer sheet for it all, so that if you want to do a few more problems. Okay? All right. All right, so let's take a look at, let's do phylogenetic tree. Sometimes they will ask for you to estimate like this using a graph. 
um, with this, and oftentimes they'll give a range that, like, instead of like 17.5, like being having to have 17.5, they might also accept 17 or 18, all right, on either side of that, all right, on that estimation part, all right, so you can have a kind of a range in there. Um, number um, three, uh, what animal shares the most recent common ancestor with the brown bear? So here's your brown bear. How do we know? Uh, we look for going back the, le the most recent divergence. So here would be the common ancestor. So it's more recent from the polar bear. And then four asks you to describe the branch points and lines in the phylogenetic tree. For this particular one, each of the branch points represents a divergence from a common ancestor. And then in this one, the length of the lines, this one is the how, tells you how long ago that occurred. It gives you a millions of years ago. In every phylogenetic tree, does the length of lines mean that? No, they have to indicate that um, that it means that, and they did that clearly here. Um, which of the two branches for number five from the common ancestor has the most living descendants? So here's the two branches from the common ancestor. So it's the bear line. And then uh, the red panda is most closely related to which animal? So here's your red panda. We look at back to the common ancestor. Most recent common ancestor would be that raccoon. So it's more closely related to the raccoon. Then the last question about this picture um, asks you about which are most closely related, giant panda to red panda or giant panda to the polar bear. And they ask this specifically in the, because of common mistakes that students make. So here's your giant panda, here's the red panda, and here's the polar bear. So uh, um, a common mistake amongst students is looking at the names along the right-hand side and seeing that giant panda and red panda are right next to each other versus giant panda and polar bear are several apart. Some students make the false assumption then that the giant panda is most related to the red panda. Um, and that is not true. So what you have to do is look back to the most recent common ancestor. So if we compare the yeah, giant yeah. panda and the red panda, their most recent common ancestor is all the way back here versus the giant panda and the polar bear, their most recent common ancestor is right here. So there is more, they have a more recent common ancestor, which then is, means that they're more closely related. All right, so that's cool. Okay. So now we are comparing something different. We're comparing DNA and telling relatedness through comparing DNA. So you have this organism A, and we're comparing it to four different samples from four different outside organisms. And we're looking at just one side of the DNA. So I asked you how many bases are in each one of these samples, and so you should have counted those and gotten 21 for number eight. Number nine asks you, looking at organism A, which one um, samples one through four, which one is 100% complementary to organism A? Complementary, what they're referring to is the complementary basis. So like if we look at um, organism A, is GTG, so a complementary would be CAC. And so when you compare that, you should have gotten sample three as 100% complementary. Then I ask you for number 10, what other sample, so we're looking at sample one, two, and four, is likely to pair with one of the strands um, from organism A? And that should be sample one, because while all, the, the, all of them are not complementary, you have a high percentage of them that are. And then um, looking at sample one, it asks you for number 11, how many of the base pairs are non-complementary between the strands? So if you counted those up, you should have gotten five. So five or nine So then it asks you to calculate the divergence between the organism A and that um, sample one. So sample one, they had five bases that were different, that were non-complementary. So you divide that by the total number of bases, which is 21, and you get a divergence of 23.8. So that means sample one is, has, uh, has diverged 23.8% away from the order of bases in organism A. So that, by that same idea then, they ask you to do the same thing for sample two and four. So two and four, you had to count up then 
So looking at two, you had to look at, compare it to um, organism A and count up how many of the bases are not complementary. So when you did that, you should have gotten 12 divided by the total bases of 21. So we get a 57% difference. Um, and then four, you should have gotten 14 of them being non-complementary. So divided that by 21, you get 66.7. All right, so then <coughs> they have us um, organizing these four samples from most homologous or most like sample A to least homologous or most different from sample A. So three is the most homologous because there's 0% divergence. It's 100% the same. One is the next one um, is 23.8 divergence, then two at 57, and four at 66.7. So then 15 asks you using this, which sample is most closely related to organism A, and that would be the one that has the most in common or the least divergent, um, and so that would be sample three. Um, 16 asks you how the divergence um, can give scientists information about relatedness. So we have a correlation between divergence and relatedness. So the more divergent, the, the more divergence, the least related, or the least divergent, the more related that they are. So that means that the sequences are more in common. And so then you had to fill in the tree, so they gave you an empty tree, and you had to fill in where the samples would be on this tree from the common ancestor. And so sample three, the most um, uh, the uh, sorry, the least divergent here from organism A here would be um, there's less divergence than occurred in here, so we have almost one break in the line. All right, then sample one has more in common than sample two and four here. All right, and so that's where we where we at there. Any questions on that? Good. Okay, so now the next one. It's another piece of data um, looking at sequences of amino acids, and which are ultimately um, coded for by your DNA. So this is a cytochrome C protein that, so when we're looking at this, this is the position of the amino acids, so one through 40, then 41 through 77, all the way up to, so there's 112 amino acids in this particular protein. And we're comparing these sequence of these different amino acids that make up this one protein amongst these various, on the left hand side, these various organisms. So, um, so A down below, how many different species are we comparing? We're comparing eight. B asks you what do the letters represent? Those are your individual amino acids in your chain. And the asterisks mean that the individuals do not have an amino acid at that particular point. All right, so that's what we're looking at. So then number 19 asks you to circle in here um, uh, which, which pairs would have the most divergence. So they have A, B, and C. So you had to look at A and say, okay, whale and human and whale and tuna. So which pair based upon morphology, so you could be looking at structural, so thinking about what does a human look like, what does a whale look like, what are the structures of humans and whales versus whales and tuna. Um, and um, uh, circling which pairing in each one of these cases would have the most divergence and to just justify your answer. So because of that, there's really not a right or wrong answer for this. So for instance, somebody in, in, in A might say, oh, the most divergence I think maybe is between the whale and human. The reason is that whales live in the ocean, humans don't. Whales have fins humans don't, all right, and so on and so forth. So you could look at morphological structures and um, with that. And so that's what this is ab um, about. So like I said, there's not really a right or wrong answer here just based upon your justification. But we're gonna use this and compare it to, later on, the actual cytochrome C molecule. Yes? And we're gonna see that when we look at the, the, the data. So then, so then the rest of this, so they did this for a reason, they had you do this for a reason to show that sometimes physical characteristics are not um, supported by molecular characteristics. So let's look at this. So now, going back to the model, it says to write down the differences between the amino acid sequence of between humans 
and the following organisms. So we had to go through with the humans and compare it with the tuna and write how many differences there are. So tuna, you should have 21, whale is 10, rhesus monkey is one, chicken is 13, pig is 10, yeast is 45, and fly is 27. So then based upon this data, we can tell that humans for 21 are most closely related to rhesus monkey because there's the least amount of differences and most distantly related to the yeast because there's the most amount of differences. All right, so then we can fill out our phylogenetic tree based upon the number of differences in the amino acids. So you have to put the organisms here. Um, and so looking at this, here's your humans. Humans and rhesus monkey would come together here because there's only, if we go back to here, only one difference. Then we have the most next is in common with the whale and the pig. Notice here, so here's the whale and the pig. Could I have put, so this says pig and whale, could I have put whale and pig? Yes, and it would not have changed. Why? Because the difference between human and whale is 10 and human and pig is 10 and so it's the same. And so, so that would have, wouldn't have mattered there. Um, and then we have the next, with the chicken, then the next uh, uh, greatest differences with the tuna, then the fly, then the yeast. All right, so using this, then these questions here are asking about this. So it says 23, how do your predictions about relatedness based upon morphology, ecology, and lifestyle compare to the relatedness information developed from the DNA data or the cytochrome um, C data in question um, 22? So going back to the example that I used for this, that somebody might say the whale and the human are, would have the most divergence, um, and the whale and tuna um, would be more similar um, based upon morphological features. But if we look at cytochrome C data, human and whales are more closely related um, than um, the whale and the tuna. They have a more distant common ancestor. So that that. That question there is just to show you that structural features um, uh, and that the may give you kind of be misleading um, in, in that. Um, 24, the mammals are from pig to humans, um, and they're all in the cla same class because they diverge from the same common ancestor. When you compare for 25, the sequences of the data are the amino acids in the mammals to one another. They're more in common or have less differences than those outside of these mammals. So, um, and then lastly, 26, could, should scientists make a tree and infer evolutionary relationships based on data from a single protein? This was made by looking at just one protein, cytochrome C. Realistically, that we shouldn't just focus on one protein, we look at a bunch of different proteins and a bunch of different DNA and make our data and our tree from that. That would be more accurate. All right? And that is your final How do you guys do on that? Ordovician um, and ends in the Silurian. 
Two begins in the Devonian and ends in the Carboniferous. Three begins in the Permian, ends in Triassic. Four begins in Triassic and ends in Jurassic. And five begins in Crustaceous and ends in the Paleogene. Um, these periods are defined for number seven by the timing of these mass extinctions. So then eight asks you, um, these mass extinctions are named based upon the period in which they started. So therefore, all of these five here that you wrote in each of the first blanks, those are the names of the extinctions, the, like the Permian extinction and so on, all right? Um, the line is never flat for number nine. What does this tell you about the rate of extinctions? That the rate of extinction is never the same. So it's constantly changing the rate of extinction. The second part of number nine says that the, it never goes down to zero. The rate of extinction never goes down to zero. So that, what does that mean? That there's extinction always happening, all right? And so never goes down to zero. 10, species can come and become extinct for many reasons. Some of those you can have um, lack of food um, or space or resources like that. Um, climate change, uh, natural disasters, asteroids hitting the earth, um, disease, the spread of disease, all of those things could cause species to become extinct. And so number 11, you only had to do that if after you read this, there were new information for you to write in there, all right? So it says it's not yet. All right, and last one, diversity of life. This for 12, this graph is different than the last graph. The, the x-axis is the same, but instead of extinction rates, we have the number of families. So the higher number here means that, the, or the higher peaks here mean that there's more families and therefore greater diversity. So the overall for 13 trend here in terms of this is we have an increase, an overall increase in the number of families over time. So then 14 asks you about biodiversity. So that's the diversity of living things. So then if there's more families, then there's more diversity. So diversity also has increased over time. So then it asks you to mark the locations of the five mass extinctions here. So that's what these arrows here um, are. So the timing of those. And you can see that for 16 here, right after each one of these extinctions, what happens is we get a decline in the number of families. And that makes sense if you have organisms that die off and are extinct and you have less variety and less diversity. So then 17 asks you estimate how long it takes for the number of families to recover. Um, after a mass extinction. So this varies depending upon which extinction you're looking at. But you can look at here, so the diversity goes down. And so you can estimate from here to when it returns, all right, and estimate from the millions of years ago. So somewhere around 20 million years or so on, all right? All right, and the last little bit here, this last set of questions talks about the last um, extinction, the Cretaceous mass extinction and how you have these rodents that survived it um, and why that might be. So it asks you for 18 to why the small rodents were able to uh, survive. And they um, burrow underneath the ground, so therefore they could have protect, been protected in that manner. Um, they also are smaller, so they need relatively small amounts of food and water and resources and things like that that would have helped with them. 19, the extinction of the dinosaurs. It says, how did that allow adaptive radiation of mammals to occur? You get this like whole big explosion of different mammals. Um, and that's because if the dinosaurs die off, if they go extinct, the dinosaurs use space on the earth, they use food and water and so on. So if you have this whole group of animals become extinct, now you have this whole part of the earth that's open for other organisms to make use of. Um, 20, what evidence do you see that um, large-scale adaptive radiation occurred following the extinctions? That is, we get, after the initial drop, it goes back up, the diversity of species. And so, so that's our evidence. 21, if mammals would have been wiped out during the Cretaceous uh, mass extinction, we would have no mammals on Earth. So that would be us. All right, 20, 22. Um, some biologists think we're in the middle of, gosh, we have a few minutes left. Um, 
Some biologists think we're in the middle of a current um, sixth mass extinction, and they think some people think that we are the cause of that, that we're the first individuals on Earth that actually are causing the mass extinction. Um, and so, because we have a high extinction rate of organisms becoming extinct. So number 22 asks about what kinds of things are we doing to cause that? So we are polluting waterways, we're polluting airways, which are killing off um, organisms. Um, we are, um, can be affecting the climate. Uh, we uh, destroy habitat. We deforestation where we cut down trees. And, we kill things for um, horns. Yes, and we kill things, we hunt things to extinction. We've done that numerous times in our history. Uh, and so on. So all of those things. Um, 23, data that would support that we are in the middle of a sixth mass extinction is if we had data on the number of uh, or the biodiversity. So if we could physically uh, or numerically prove that our numbers of families are going down, um, that would be the data that we, that we would need. And then um, uh, what would we predict after a sixth mass, mass extinction based upon um, what has happened in the past, after every extinction in the past, families have gone up afterwards. All right, so we're